Yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about isotopes and radioisotopes to prepare for further investigating cell metabolism using yeast in aerobic and anaerobic conditions. So you may be familiar with the idea of isotopes. An isotope is basically a version of an element that has the same number of protons in the nucleus, because after all, the number of protons in the nucleus defines the element, but it has a different number of neutrons. Some isotopes are less stable than others, and these are radioisotopes. So keep in mind that not all isotopes are radioisotopes, but radioisotopes are unstable, and therefore they emit energy. There are a few different types of particles that are emitted from radioisotopes, alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha particles are emitted by very large, heavy elements, so they can cause a lot of damage because of their size. And alpha particles are comprised of two protons and two neutrons. So because there are two protons, this is considered helium. Some examples you may be familiar with include uranium and radium. So radium-226, for example, when it decays, it releases the two protons and the two neutrons, and it forms radon gas, which is a dangerous gas that can sometimes be found um, in homes. So homes have to be tested for radon um, often. The second type of particles are beta particles. So these are higher energy particles, and they're emitted when a neutron in the unstable nucleus decays into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. So some examples of elements that emit beta particles include hydrogen, carbon, phosphate, and sulfur. And I'm going to go into some more specific details about these four examples. Finally, our gamma emitters. So gamma emitters emit electromagnetic radiation, which can be very dangerous because it can penetrate material very well. So this is the type of radiation that you see in movies that is demonstrated to be very scary. Some examples of this include x-rays and gamma radiation. Okay, so these beta emitters that I am using as examples here all have different energy and they have different half-lives. So half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of the radioactivity in these radioisotopes to decay. So I'll be pointing out some of these half-lifes to give you an example of what that means. And in the experiments we'll be using, we'll be using tritium, which is this first beta emitter. So tritium is a pretty safe beta emitter to work with. It has very low energy, so it does not penetrate materials very well. The beta particles cannot go very far and they cannot penetrate materials. Tritium has a half-life of about 12 and a half years. So that means it takes about 12 and a half years for half of that energy to decay. C14 has low to, low to medium energy and a long half-life. You may have heard of C14 in carbon dating. So the ratio of C14 to C12 can sometimes be measured and used to determine the age of old um, bones and things that are found buried. P32 is a very high energy beta emitter. So it's high energy, but the you can use simple plastic shields to block these particles. So it's fairly easy to work with. You just have to be careful when you're working with it. It has a relatively short half-life, just a couple weeks. And finally, S35 is a low energy emitter that can be found in organic molecules and again can be used for various dating procedures. Okay, so we know these beta emitters emit particles with energy and we're going to use tritium in order to measure something. So how are we going to measure radioactive decay? The units we use are called curies. The abbreviation is CI, named after the scientists curies. So one Curie is the equivalent of 2.2 times 10 to the 12th disintegrations per minute, or DPMs. We'll be using very small amounts of tritium. 
So we'll be using microcurie amounts. So one micro microcurie is the equivalent of 2.2 times 10 to the 6 dpms. There are a couple different ways you can measure this decay. One is with a Geiger counter and the second is with a scintillation counter. Geiger counters are good for a quick survey of your work area. You can check and see if you've had an accidental spill or there's been contamination. They cannot be used to quantitate your experiment. And the way they work is that they have an inert gas inside with some electrodes, and these can detect emitted particles from radioisotopes. And we'll have a demonstration of this in class. Scintillation counters are very useful because you can quantify the emissions from your experiment. And the way scintillation counters work is you mix your sample, and in this case we have a low energy tritium emitter, and we mix it with a scintillation fluid that basically turns those uh, beta particle emissions into light. So it interacts with the chemicals and the scintillation fluid. So we put that into a scintillation counter and the counter detects light that is emitted from our samples and it quantifies it as counts per minute or CPMs. So you can change counts per minute, you can convert CPMs into disintegrations per minute or DPMs. And in our case, our scintillation counter machine will do this for us. So we'll be able to automatically get DPMs from our experiment. We'll be going over safety precautions and the exact approach to this experiment in class, but this should give you a good idea of what we'll be looking at and how we'll be measuring it.